I wanted people, I wanted people in the public to to read it and to really think about all the wonderful stories that have happened in Arkansas that people unfortunately don't know very much about. So I, I, I always take great pleasure in doing this kind of work. If you don't mind, what I'd like to do is start by talking about the genesis of my book. If I can get pages, yeah, here we go. Um, I first started working on this book. Well, actually, let me back up even further than that. This book was the result of an unanswered question. When I worked on my first book on South Carolina, which is where I'm from originally, I was born and raised in Charleston in the South Carolina low country. I had written about this woman and her name was Sarah Z. Daniels. And she was from the Columbia, South Carolina area. And she was a home demonstration agent. She worked for the South Carolina Home uh, Extension Service, Agricultural Extension Service. And she had lost her job because of her civil rights activism. Now in the process of working on that book, <clears throat> it never occurred to me to try to find out what a home demonstration was, or agent was. I'd never heard of the home demonstration agent. I'd never heard of the extension um, service, even though apparently was around me all the time. I didn't pay very much attention to it. But I was living in Arkansas at that point, And I thought, well, there's really not a whole lot I can do about that in South Carolina, but I do want to see what that looks like in Arkansas. And so I just started nosing around and behold, there was all this information about home demonstration agents, the Arkansas Agricultural Extension Service and their work in rural communities. And my intention was for this only to be a little paper. Uh, it was a paper that I presented at a small conference at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock. And I really thought that would be the end of it. But then I started digging around and I discovered that there's this entire world of rural black women home demonstration agents, genes supervising industrial teachers. I'll be talking about all of these groups today and this world of rural civil rights activism. And it became very clear to me really quickly that this was not going to be a story strictly about black suffering. It was also going to be a story about black entrepreneurship, black land ownership, black agency, black on ownership, uh, black empowerment. So all the things that we typically don't think about when we think about rural Black lives. And so I just really started digging into this. And the more I found, the more I found. I really didn't think I would find as much as I did. And so this work, while it's pretty dense and it involves a lot of research, it really only scratches the surface of the work that I think needs to be done still on rural Black lives in Arkansas and throughout the South generally. So many of the women that I'm gonna talk about um, many of them, most of them come from the Arkansas Delta, but not all of them come from the Arkansas Delta. And of course, if you're, you're, you're familiar with the state, this is pretty much the Arkansas Delta. And there's at least one woman who wasn't working in the Arkansas Delta. She was in fact working in Southwest Arkansas. I even write about a woman in the book who was from New York, who lived her entire life in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and she was probably one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, African American um, in Sebastian County. Here's a list of what I'm going to talk about this evening, and of course, this is the great state of Arkansas, but here's a list of what I'm going to be talking about this evening. I'm going to mention the Smith-Lever Act of 1914, the Cooperative Extension Service, the Elaine Massacre, very briefly, Southern Tenant Farmers, very briefly, Gene Supervisor, Industrial Teachers, the Arkansas Association of Colored Women. And then I want to add with the person I always love to talk about when I talk about rural Black women is Annie Zachary Pike. Now, first about the Smith-Lever Act of 1914, that is what creates the United States Agricultural Extension Service. And it basically places farm and home demonstration work across the nation under the direction of the federal government. So you have farm and home agents who were deemed necessary to help rural people, regardless of race, learn new skills, implement new skills and technologies to improve farm life. And the Arkansas Agricultural Cooperative Service was founded shortly after the Smith-Lever Act. One of the things that people don't know when they think about the Smith-Lever Act, if they know anything about it, was that while they created the extension service throughout the South, it followed the conventions of the day, which means that the Arkansas Agricultural Extension Service was segregated. So the headquarters were uh, for white 
farm and home agents were at the University of Arkansas. The headquarters for African-American home and farm agents was at the University of Arkansas Agricultural and Mechanical um, College, also known today as the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. Home demonstrations, of course, by and large, were women. Again, their task was to improve life for rural people, um, improve homes and farms. They are also expected to form what were known as home demonstration clubs. They're called extension service clubs today, but for the longest time, they were called home demonstration clubs. This gets to be a little complicated for Black women uh, because their lives are deeply informed by entrenched racism, segregation, and unequal access to resources. And they are considered interlopers in rural communities, largely because they are advocating health, self, self help measures and they're educated. So, if you're talking about the Arkansas Delta, many white Delta landowners were very concerned that they would inculcate their Black labor force with ideas that could potentially dislodge the economic and po uh, political power they held over them. So, it was complicated, but complicated doesn't mean difficult or impossible. It means difficult, but not necessarily impossible. So despite the limitations, and again, due to racism and unequal resources, home demonstration agents had to utilize the Arkansas Agricultural Extension Services agenda. They essentially had to manipulate the agenda to make it fit the needs of the communities in which they worked. So one of the first Black home demonstration agents in Arkansas is this very fair-skinned African-American woman on the left here named Mary L. Ray. And she was hired to work as a home demonstration agent in Arkansas in 1918, uh, shortly after her husband, Harvey Cincinnatus Ray, became the first African-American farm agent in, in the state. And by 1920, she's responsible for home demonstration agents, Black home demonstration agents throughout the state. And she understood the racial landscape in which she worked. She knew that if she was going to help rural Blacks, she had to carefully navigate her relationship with local whites to procure the resources that she needed and to ensure that they would continue to support the extension service programs that African-Americans so desperately needed. So I always say that Black farm agents and extensions and home demonstration agents had to engage in stealth activism. Because again, their very presence as professional educated people and professional educated Black women demonstrated to Black people what was possible despite American racism. They also had to navigate such issues as food and health insecurity because they recognized that sick people could not be politically viable people. So they did not talk explicitly about voting rights and that kind of thing, because they had to address more immediate issues. But that was very much a part of the work that they did, but they had to be very careful about all of that. So one of the things they did do was to form home demonstration clubs. And there's a statewide, there was a statewide organization of Black home demonstration clubs that was formed in 1936, because again, everything is segregated at this point. So even though there is a statewide white organization of home demonstration clubs, African-American women can't join that. And they do similar things. They learned about food preservation skills, but they also serve the spaces for women to gather to discuss important issues uh, occurring in their communities and in the larger world. And I always like to tell people that when we think about home demonstration clubs or what are today called ex extension service clubs, it's not just about canning tomatoes or corn or something like that. Canning tomatoes is not that interesting and rural people are intelligent people. So again, they're very much aware of the world around them, the world that exists outside of the rural spaces where they live. So there are all kinds of conversations going on about all kinds of things while they're canning tomatoes and corn and whatever. And so this is just one example of a Black home demonstration club canning demonstration. Yes, they all seem to be very attentive to whatever's in these jars, but the question I always ask is, what are the conversations happen during these gatherings? And I promise you, it's not all about canning tomatoes or corn. So when we talk about home demonstration agents, 
they serve in multiple capacities. Now, this is a picture of assistant home demonstration agents from 1950, but I just want to go back a little bit to talking about some of the things that Black home demonstration agents did in rural Black communities. One example I'd like to show you is um, during the Mississippi flood of 1927. And of course, if you've heard about this, you know this flood inundated Eastern and Southern Arkansas. Well, home demonstration agents, regardless of race, work with the American Red Cross, albeit in segregated camps where they taught school, but they also provided much needed health care, food and housing information. They are concerned about things like food insecurity particularly where it concerned African-Americans who were, who were trying to survive the flood, uh, because one of the things that would happen was that the American Red Cross would provide free food, right, for people who were starving, essentially, but white landowners, in order to get the people to do the work that they wanted them to do, they would hold that food hostage, or they would sell the food in their stores, um, on, their, on their plantations for ridiculous prices. Um, and again, this food, this food was free. So they either held the food hostage, charged them ridiculous prices, or held the food ransom until African Americans performed the work that they wanted them to, until they could control the flood damage. But Black home demonstration agents do what they can to help African Americans. And they too are traumatized by this experience because they are witnessing firsthand the extreme poverty and races, uh, racism that has um, unintended consequences for them. And in one example, there was a home demonstration agent named Lula Taller from Pine Bluff. And she said this, my first day's work with the sufferers were ones to long be remembered. The scene was most pitiful and shall ever haunt me while life lasts. The screams of the people and the lowing of cattle could be heard in the distance. This experience apparently was so traumatic for her that she resigned her post the following year. So it, it was very difficult for them to be witness to all of this. And while they were trying to help these folks as much as they can, they understood the very fragile ground on which they walked. I mentioned home demonstration clubs uh, earlier and the importance of these spaces for women to ask important questions about um, health, family, and child care concerns. And this is just one example that I actually found in the archives at the University of, of, of Arkansas. And while it's from, you know, much later in the period, 1954, 1955, I think this is still an important and necessary example to demonstrate that there were home demonstration clubs, but they were segregated. This is very clear when you look at the front of the, the pamphlet here that says the Jefferson County Negro Home Demonstration Club. But, you know, again, note the things that are important to them and note the fact that while we're talking about rural people, rurality does not equal ignorance. So you have women who are the presidents of these clubs and the vice president, the secretary. And yes, they are concerned about food and nutrition and home management and child development and family life and on and on and on and on and on. They're very much aware of the needs in their communities. They don't need home demonstration agents to tell them you need better food and you need to take care of your children. They're already aware of this. So one of the things that I like to emphasize is that Home demonstration agents are not in these communities to tell people what to do. They're there to work with the people who already know what the needs are um, in, in their communities. And so again, I think I mentioned already that uh, the Black Home Demonstration Club, the, 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 the statewide organization was formed um, in, 19, in 1936. Now, when I talk about rural Black women's activism, I spend a lot of time locating Black women's activism and uncovering their stories and state history that we think we know well. And this is an example of what I mean. I wanna to turn to talking very quickly about the Elaine uh, race massacre. Um, and I'll give you a very, very brief overview because there are several good books on this topic already. African-American farmers and members of the Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America uh, this organization was founded in Winchester, Arkansas in 1918, and they meet at a church in Hoopspurs, Arkansas and Phillips County to discuss plans to demand their fair share of that year's cotton crop, which, um, as I understand, it was one of the most plentiful crops ever. The very fact that they had organized 
and asserted their right to the fruits of their labor, challenged the racial and economic status quo and white landowners control over their African-American labor force. All of this, of course, is also happening during and after World War I when tensions are already high for any number of reasons in the post-war year, years. Long story short, um, a gunfight ensues between the members of this organization and Phillips County law enforcement officers. Um, hundreds of people are arrested and eventually 12 men were pointed out as the Elaine 12. So we think we know that story. But there's another part to the story that people don't talk about. When they arrested hundreds of people, when they killed and arrested hundreds of people, more than a few of them were women. Women were also members of this organization. But in many instances, and this is changing, when people talk about what happens in Elaine, Arkansas in 1919, they forget to factor women into the story. And I'm talking about women like Cleola Miller, who was the wife of James Miller, uh, who was one of the head honchos in this organization, but she too was a member um, of this organization. She too was one of the folks who basically had to run for her life when people came from all over um, Southern Arkansas and then across the river from Mississippi and were randomly shooting at African-Americans. Um, and I also found her membership card. So if we take a look at this, uh, what we can figure out from looking at this card is that she was 24 years old, so she was a very young woman in 1919. She was a member of the Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America. She had three children, said she believed in God, and when asked about her health, she said she was unhealthy. And I know this is very difficult to read, but I've looked at it so many times, I know what it says. Um, but she was a member of this organization, and when all of these people were being killed, many of whom were not members of the organization. Um, she's among those who are caught up in, in, in all the chaos of all of this. But what does this mean? What this tells us is once again, rural people are not ignorant, nor are they passive. To be a member of this kind of organization at this time in rural Arkansas was incredibly dangerous work. But when you have people who don't have much to lose, they don't have much to lose. And they too recognize what's right and what's wrong and what they are um, entitled to. I wanna use another example here. The Southern Tenant Farmers Union from in, in Tyronza, Arkansas that was founded in 1934. Once again, I asked the question, why do we assume that the members were all men? What about women like Eliza Nolden? who was a very active member of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, um, who was so active, in fact, that she was kidnapped by some local farmers, planters, um, and beaten, beaten within an inch of her life and subsequently died in 1938. And this was because she was an active member of the organization. She had participated in a sharecropper strike um, and then later actually sued for $15,000 because of the uh, because of because she had been beaten and quite possibly sexually assaulted um, by white landowners who were members of the East Arkansas Planters Group. So we have to know these stories because we need to know that their activism mattered and that in more than a few cases it cost them everything they own in Cleola Miller's case and sometimes their lives in Eliza Nolden's case. So let's turn now to talking about the gene supervising industrial teachers. And they're often called gene supervisors. Sometimes they're called gene teachers. So I'll use that term uh, interchangeably. So this uh, gene supervisors were black educators who were funded by an endowment left by this woman. This is Anna Thomas Jean. She lived from 1822 to 1907 white woman, Quaker from, Pits from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she left a $1 million endowment before she died for, um, to provide for the education of African-Americans in the rural South. And I always like to look up how much money in the 19, early 20th century is worth in 20, um, 2023. So $1 million in 1907 will be worth about $32 million now. So that's not a small amount of money that she left for these folks. And so when she leaves this endowment, she leaves it uh, for the creation of what 
was known as the Negro Rural School Fund, which was later named the Jeans Fund. And so with this money, what African-Americans were able to do is go into rural communities where there were limited educational opportunities, or in some cases, no schools at all. So they were responsible, they were charged with teaching the basic reading, writing, and arithmetic. But if you take a look at this slide here, you see that they're responsible for a whole lot of other things. And that in fact, the work very closely resembles that of home demonstration agents. So they're responsible for teaching them things like cooking, sewing, chair caning, mat making, the laws of sanitation, which is a really important uh, message that the extension service is getting across to rural people, regardless of race, but also things like pig and poultry clubs and general welfare associations. So once again, this deep investment in improving the quality of life um, among rural people. And so they were very important for those reasons, but once again, they also help African-Americans gain access to education at a time when the school boards and the school systems were almost entirely white and not particularly interested in providing African Americans with any kind of education beyond the very basic things. Um, one of these women in rural Arkansas was Annie Curie, Curie down in Mississippi County, not too far away from where I am right now. And she was born on a farm in Morrillton and Conway County in 1885. She was educated at Shorter College in Little Rock, came back to Morrillton to teach and later married a man who was a principal in the colored schools in Mississippi County. And she was very well known for her educational advocacy. She was, for example, an active member of the Arkansas Colored Teachers Association. That organization was segregated until the late 1960s and a member of the Mississippi County Teachers Association. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I think is really important for people to know is when we talk about community improvement and sanitation, all the things that Jean's teachers and home demonstration agents were interested in, it also included um, things like the National Negro Health Week movement. And this was in, um, and from 1915 um, well into the 1950s, and in some communities even later than that. And Jean's teachers and home demonstration agents were very involved in this nationwide um, effort. What it did was that it provided much health care, much needed health care access to rural Blacks, almost always in cooperation with African American, white physicians, nurses, genes teachers. And so if we took a look at this ad here, you'll see at the very bottom that um, in uh, the 1930s in Mississippi County, they're meeting um, in places like Osceola, Grider, Blyville in observing the National Negro Health Week. So you have white doctors, white health professionals, African American health professionals, and if you notice at the very bottom here, Negro, Jeans, Supervisor, and Tory. So all of these people are working together to improve health outcomes for rural Blacks. And rural health also involves, it also meant sexual health. So in this example, this is from the Planned Feder Parenthood Federation of America, which in 1942 created a division of Negro service. So if you'll notice down at the bottom here where I've circled Arkansas, these are the names of Jean's teachers in Ashley County, Bradley County, Mississippi County, Nevada County. Uh, all of these people are asking for birth control information to take back to their communities, not necessarily because they thought the communities needed it, but often because the women are asking for this information themselves. So again, I think it's really important to underscore the amount of agency these rural women exercise on their own. So when I talk about the Jeans Teacher Program, the Jeans Teacher Program lasts from about 1907 to 1968 Southwide, but it ends in about 1950 in Arkansas. And I'm about to explain to you why that's the case. I suspect it ended when it did in Arkansas because of this woman, Isla Upchurch, who was a Jeans supervisor in Nevada County in Northwest Arkansas. Now, she was not a native of Arkansas. She actually was from Mississippi, but she moved to Arkansas in 1925 and was there until she died in 1989. 
Uh, she was a member of the Arkansas Congress of Parent Colored Parents and Teachers, and in fact was its president in 1944. But she was also a civil rights advocate at a time when such activism was deemed incredibly dangerous. Upchurch was an NAACP member, um, and this is just an image here from the, um, the State Congress of Colored Parents and Teachers. So they meet at the famous Dunbar High School in Little Rock, but she's also a member of the NAACP. So you see down here in 1948, uh, she is um, Assistant Secretary of the Arkansas NAACP. She's very involved in this organization. And again, the NAACP is an incredibly controversial um, organization. As a result of this, Ooh. as a result of this, she actually loses her job in 1950, 1949, 1950, right? So if you look at this ad here, they say um, she did, failed to discharge her duties properly and uh, her attitude towards the school officials and the program of the county is progressively growing from bad to worse and demands much attention. Well, that's all very vague. What does that mean? It means essentially that she was challenging the racial status quo and somebody didn't like it or several somebodies didn't like it. But she remained very active in the African-American community in Nevada, Arkansas, particularly in Prescott um, until her death in 1989. Now, all of the women that I've mentioned so far were members of the Arkansas Association of Colored Women. And if you nose around, you'll find that there's an Arkansas Federation of Club Women that was exclusively white. Black women couldn't be members of that. So in 1905, they formed the Arkansas Association of Colored Women. And this is just one example from the Daily Arkansas Gazette of some of the things that they're interested in um, in 1917. What they're particularly interested in in the 1920s or in the 19 teens is establishing industrial homes for black girls and black boys. Because far too often, if a young black person committed a crime, which most of us would consider a silly petty crime, they were sent to jail with hardened criminals. So black women are very concerned about this and they use the limited political power they have to ask the state legislature for an appropriation to help build a home for young black girls and boys. And they do manage to do that for young black boys. It takes quite a while longer for them to do this for young black girls. In fact, they're not even successful until about 1949 at getting a home for young black girls. And it only lasts for about 20 years when it's consolidated into the, um, the home for white girls in Alexandria, um, Arkansas. This is just an example of what I mean when I say I, that they were very concerned about young girls going to jail with hardened criminals for petty crimes. This is from 1939. And they basically decide that we're not going to let this girl go to jail for what was probably a really small crime. I mean, you can see here they were going to sentence her uh, to 10 years imprisonment, 13 year old, right? Uh, and so they said, no, we're going to raise the money and we're going to send you to the Fargo Industrial School in um, Monroe County, Arkansas. And at the time, the Fargo School. Um, was a co-educational industrial school, but this industrial school um, later became a home for wayward African-American girls, as I said, until it was absorbed by the, the white institution um, in 1969. Now, I want to end by talking about a living rural Black woman activist, a woman by the name of Annie Zachary Pike. And Annie Zachary, well, Annie Ruth Davidson, as she was um, born, uh, was born in 1931 in Bay Creek, located in Phillips County, Arkansas. Um, she began her formal education at Trent Elementary School, and she later went to a private Black co-educational school, also in Monroe County, called the Consolidated White River Academy. And she graduated from there in 1948. And I always like to tell people that up until and just after the 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court case, there were well over 100 Black co-educational boarding schools throughout the South. Unfortunately, most of them began to close after the Supreme Court decision. 
Miss Annie then later on went on, and, and everybody calls her Miss Annie. Miss Annie later went on to earn a nursing degree from the predominantly Homer G. Phillips Hospital School of Nursing in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, it no longer exists. In 1952, she comes back to Arkansas and she marries a guy by the name of Grover Cleveland Zachary, a man who was 30 years her junior, who was also a significant African-American landowner in Phillips County who had sharecroppers who worked for him. Unfortunately, her husband becomes ill in 1962 and Miss Annie takes over the farm operation. And she works very closely with Black home extension agents um, and challenge racism with bankers. But, but, but she also had the protection of being the wife of a private landowner. But she challenged bankers who would cheat African Americans with fear of little recourse, a little fear of legal recourse. And she recounted her experience with racism and sexism as a Black farm woman when she said, I've definitely known that prejudice exists because the road that I've traveled has been dark and lonely. And a lot of it, I feel is because I'm a woman. And sometimes people feel that you don't know things and that you're unprotected, that you're a lame duck. When I felt though, that I was going to be cheated, I just had to stand up and say, no. So this is a woman, you know, who, who understood her self worth. Miss Annie was a farmer but she was also a community activist. And she always said that she was, quote, interested in a better way of life for my people, end quote. So she was involved in the local and state Black home demonstration organizations. She was a member of the Arkansas Association of Colored Women. Later on, she was even a member of the Arkansas Farm Bureau Federation. But in the 1960s, she becomes involved in politics as a member of the Arkansas Republican Party. And this is after she meets this guy, Winthrop Rockefeller, New York millionaire, Republican, transplant to Arkansas. She supported him in his 1966 run for governor. And when he became Arkansas's first Republican governor since Reconstruction in 1967, he rewarded Miss Annie by appointing her to the Arkansas Welfare Board. And Miss Annie recalled her surprise because there was a lot of media attention about her appointment. But she had this to say about her appointment. She said she was, quote, a country lady who was used to chickens and hogs and being out in the fields with the tenants who had suddenly become a celebrity. And by the way, she served on this commission well until the 1970s and 80s. Governors just kept reappointing her. You know, Governor Pryor reappointed her, Clinton reappointed her, so she kept serving. But she was very much involved in Republican Party politics. She, for example, attended the 1972 Republican National Convention in Miami, Florida as co-chairperson of the Platform Committee. She also attended the National Federation of Republican Women where she was seated next to First Lady Pat Nixon, and she supported his husband for, uh, for, for president, um, Spiro D. Agnew's wife, um, and a host of other fairly well-known people. She even, even gave a speech at this meeting where she was introduced by Art Linkletter. And here's part of what she had to say about her experience as a Southern Black woman in the Republican Party. She said, I have definitely been a guinea pig in this race, but to make progress, someone has to make great sacrifices. I feel it's time for women to realize this, come forward and get involved in the affairs of our country. Miss Annie also that year became the first African-American to run to file and run for an elected position in 20th century Arkansas when she vied for a seat on the state Senate. She didn't win, but she only lost by about 800 votes. She remained involved in Arkansas Republican, Par uh, 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 Arkansas Republican Party politics until the mid 1970s. Uh, this is the back half of her um, campaign flyer. And you can see here 4-H, Farm Bureau, Women's Federated Club, the list goes on and on and on. She was also vice president of the Arkansas Minority 
Republican convention. And this is a, a little notepad from when she was running for that position. Um, and again, as I said, she lost, but she didn't lose by that much. So that says a lot about the, the sort of political um, sway she held in Arkansas, particularly um, in the Delta. Ms. Annie was also very involved in education. She um, initiated the first National Teachers Day, was a longtime member of the Parent Teachers Association, which became the um, Arkansas Education Association after it desegregated. She was also a member of the White House Conference on Aging, um, the National Conference of uh, Christians and Jews. I mean, too many organizations um, to list. And she's now in her early 90s. She's mostly retired from her many activities, but her work and her activism as a rural black woman act uh, a rural black woman is noteworthy because it influenced monumental change not only in Arkansas but throughout the nation. So how do we sum all of this up? I sum this up in about three very important ways. Agrarian Black women's identities are complex, multi-layered, and they've always been. They are more than the sharecroppers or the agricultural laborers that we tend to hear so much about. Their lives are complicated. They are complicated. Their involvements are multi-layered and complicated. Number two, rural Black lives do not exist apart from what was happening in Arkansas and around the nation. If you look at the records, they are talking about voting rights. Just after World War II, they're talking about the United Nation. They're talking about things that many of us would assume rural people have no interest in, and that's not accurate. Rural people are not unaware, and rurality should never be equated with ignorance. Rural Black women organized around issues that impacted their communities, just like women everywhere else. They understood what their communities needed. They were not passive actors in getting the resources they needed from their communities. They worked in partnership with farm agents and home agents and members of these clubs or any other um, organization. Agricultural labor does not mean that you are unaware of the needs of your community. And so in doing this, what they did most effectively is they paved the way for the next generation of rural Black women activists who labor to ensure that African-Americans could access better living by their own bootstraps in rural Arkansas. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Jones-Branch. That was, that was brilliant. Um, <laughs>